Como habíamos prometido en el programa anterior, vamos a adentrarnos en la situación de Estados Unidos. Para eso estamos en línea con el compañero Ashley Smith, militante y escritor socialista, miembro del DCA y del colectivo Tempes. Hola, Ashley. Un placer eh, tener la posibilidad de charlar contigo. La situación política de Estados Unidos muestra elementos de radicalización y polarización, con la inmensa rebelión antirracista como protagonista central, pero también acciones de grupos de extrema derecha. ¿Podrías describir brevemente tu opinión sobre la situación social y política de Estados Unidos en general y la dinámica de estos elementos en particular? Sí, creo que el U.S. es probably one of the most politically polarized societies of the advanced capitalist world. And that's a long-term phenomenon that has been dramatically intensified by the crisis that began in 2008. And then with the onrushing recession, whose arrival was very clear toward the end of last year, and the pandemic has dramatically intensified that recession. So now we are in the midst of a catastrophic pandemic. Hundreds, a couple hundred thousand people have died. Um, unemployment shot up to around 15%. Now it's back to around 8%. People are dying at work. They're dying in nursing homes and they're dying in particular in black and brown communities. So there was already deep political polarization in the country to the left expressed around Democratic Socialists of America's dramatic growth to an organization now of around 70,000 people and to the right with the election of Donald Trump um, and then the growth of far right and fascist forces that are around the Trump um, uh, right. The, they're a hardcore within that broad Trump right. So the, the pandemic and recession have intensified that. And I think the, um, the, the George Floyd murder in Minneapolis really set off the intense period of struggle and deepened the polarization. So we've had basically a whole summer of anti-racist protests that are black led, but are very multiracial in character that have swept the entire country from the big urban centers of the country to almost every town and city, even if it's overwhelmingly white. And that shows a real dramatic shift to the left in consciousness and militancy of millions of people. So its estimates are as high as 26 million people have demonstrated in the wave of protests that we've seen. Now, that said, we are now in an ebb of that wave of protests. It's died down a little bit, but the shocking um, ruling about uh, Breonna Taylor's murder in, uh, has, has provoked another round of struggle. And I think that's gonna be characteristic of the situation because the police are gonna keep on killing black and brown people and the injustice system will not deliver justice for the victims of those murders. And so we will see rounds and rounds of new struggle. Now, that struggle has produced a counteroffensive led by Trump from the White House and then into the police departments against this multiracial anti-racist uprising. Uprising. So Trump has basically designed his entire reelection campaign around law and order racism, depicting the protests as terrorist, um, as Antifa led, as um, uh, socialist, as every kind of trick in the book. He's tried to demonize it and portray black people as out of control and dangerous threats. Um, to uh, society. So he's engaged in the worst kind of law and order racist um, politics, um, worse than we've seen really in generations. I don't know if there's a living precedent until you go back to the 1960s and early 1970s with the open kind of racism that we've seen from Donald Trump. And the police have taken that as a green light to engage in more brutality in the streets of the country. And that has provoked the increasing mobilization of far right, 
forces and fascist forces that are armed and uh, show up at uh, anti-racist demonstrations in a threatening and intimidating fashion. So I think we've got a deep political polarization in the country that will not end no matter what the results of this upcoming election. This is a deep pattern that is particularly severe in the US, but is not unique to the United States. And it is an international phenomenon, whether in the advanced capitalist countries or in the developing world. We have political polarization as a global phenomenon rooted in the crisis of the system and the crisis of neoliberalism and the search for alternatives that can go in a direction of a left and in a direction of a right. And so the contest that's shaping up internationally and in the United States is which political wing of that polarization is gonna be able to provide a solution for the majority in struggle, in electoral politics, and in social reforms and systemic change. And that's the battle that's gonna shape the coming epoch of global politics. Muy pero muy interesante tu análisis. En este escenario, con Trump alentando a los grupos racistas y de extrema derecha, hay sectores de la izquierda que llaman a votar a Biden y algunos llegan a caracterizar a Trump como fascista. Recientemente escribiste un artículo debatiendo con estas visiones. ¿Podrías desarrollar tu opinión al respecto? Yeah. Well, I think the the key thing to understand is this election is shaping all of political discussion in the United States um, by uh, mainstream political figures to the socialist left, to the social movements. Um, this is an extremely politicized society right now. I think the most politicized of my entire life um, as a conscious activist and people are engaged in an intense debate about how to deal with the rise of a right, which we have not had in this kind of way in a long, long time. Um, I think the key thing to understand about uh, the debates on the left is understanding Trump correctly. I think it is wrong to call Trump a fascist. I think that is a mischaracterization of him and his political project. He is a conservative to an authoritarian right wing political figure who is not threatening bourgeois democracy, not threatening to suspend the norms of bourgeois democracy. He's certainly pushing the boundaries of bourgeois democracy, of formal democracy, um, calling into question election results and doing all sorts of things like, um, like that. But I think that the argument that um, he's a fascist is mistaken. He's not threatening a coup to impose a dictatorship and suspend the right of elections, freedom of assembly, freedom of, of the press what, whatsoever. There are supporters of him who do advocate those kind of positions, but I think it's important to make a distinction between Trump and those people. Trump is a right-wing Republican party politician. That's the best way to under, understand him. Now, the liberals and uh, the sec sections of the left argue that we can stop this phenomenon of the growth of Trump, Trumpism, the far right and fascism by electing Joe Biden and the Democratic Party. And I think that's a, a profoundly uh, mistaken position for a few reasons. First, we have to understand Biden, the Democratic Party accurately. This is a capitalist party. It's an imperialist party, and it's committed to the restoration of neoliberalism and the position of U.S power in the world against the damage done by the Trump administration. So in a genuine sense, this is not an alternative in the sense of undoing some of the, uh, the deep problems in the system for the vast majority of people. It's a capitalist party that may be a lesser evil by comparison to Trump, but it's still evil and still against the interests of the vast majority of working class people and oppressed people in, in, the, in the country. So I think you have to understand Biden and the Democrats uh, uh, accurately, because we live in a country in the United States where we don't have a workers party of a labor party, a social democratic party. We have two capitalist parties, a right wing capitalist party and a liberal to neoliberal democratic party, another capitalist um, party. So we have a horrific election choice this year. And I think to, to think that Biden and the election of the Democrats will stop 
the rise and increased intensity of Trump, Trumpism and the far right is mistaken. First and foremost, electing Biden will restore the very political project that is the root of the rise of Trumpism to begin with. Because if you think about what I was saying earlier, the roots of the development of the far right have to do with the crisis of American capitalism. And in particular, it's neoliberal regime of accumulation over the last few decades. Attacks on the social welfare state, dismantling of unions, cuts in uh, social benefits, attacks on the rights of, uh, of oppressed people in the country. That's what Joe Biden stands for. So if he's elected, he will restore a political project that is the root of the crisis for the vast majority that has detonated the political polarization that we have in this country to begin with. So in many ways, getting him and the Democrats back in power restores the problem that generates both the left and the right in the polarization of our society. So I don't think it will stop Trumpism to get Biden and elected. If anything, I think we'll see a more radical right rise in opposition to Biden in power with an increasingly militarized faction organized on the ground in the coming years across the country. So the far right is here to stay and will not be eradicated by this election. The second problem with the left, the workers movement and social movements getting behind Biden is the classic trap of lesser evilism. That is in trying to get the second most enthusiastic capitalist party in American society elected, the workers movement and social movements will subordinate their struggle, their political demands and their independence to a party that they don't like, that a party that doesn't support their demands and opposes their movements. Just think about the Black Lives Matter uprising that we've witnessed. That movement's demands in its most clear form is for the defunding, dismantling and eventual abolition of the police. Joe Biden and the Democratic Party are absolutely opposed to that demand. So this social movement is just one example, but all the social movements and the labor movement getting behind Biden means suspending our demands and our struggle for those demands in the hopes that Biden will be um, amenable to our demands when they are in power, when he and the Democrats are in power. And there's no evidence to, that that is the case. And the biggest danger in the movements and the labor movement doing that is that we will give Biden a honeymoon. The only opposition to Biden will be from the far right, which will be like the Tea Party that we saw in opposition to Obama, more radical, more militant and militarized. And if that's the case, we know the proclivities of Joe Biden. When he faces right-wing opposition, instead of fighting it, he cuts a deal with it. So the danger is that we'll be in a situation where if Biden wins, the left, the social movements and the labor movement will go into at least a breathing spell, if not a honeymoon, the right will be the only opposition and Biden will be predisposed to cut a deal with the Republican party in the Senate and Congress to fend off the attacks from the right in, in the streets. So that instead of advancing our interests, our demands and our power, will compromise them in a fundamental way. Um, and then I think the, the final thing that's the big problem with this whole move is that it accepts the electoral framing of the problem. That is that it's an electoral problem. Trumpism is the result of the 2016 election and can be resolved by the 2020 election, which is a mistaken analysis, as I pointed out in the previous question and what I've just been saying. This is a deeply rooted political polarization and can be only resolved by mass struggle, by class struggle, strikes, demonstrations, protest movements like the Black Lives Matter uprising that can win and advance our demands and provide a credible solution that can win over sections of the working class that out of despair and hopelessness have voted for Trump out of disgust with the Democratic Party. So the battle won't be resolved in the uh, electoral arena. It will be resolved in the streets through struggle. And that means that the movements and the left have to have political independence from both capitalist parties, most importantly, the Democratic Party, so we can chart a course of independent struggle for the demands 
um, that we need met um, for reform and systemic change to rip up the roots of Trumpism in our society. Falta muy poco para las elecciones y hay todo tipo de análisis en torno a qué puede suceder. Hay quienes hablan de que Trump dará un golpe de Estado o que, como ha dicho Chomsky, habrá una guerra civil. ¿Qué escenarios ves para las elecciones y los próximos meses? ¿Y cuál debería ser la política de la izquierda socialista? Creo que una de las cosas sobre la sociedad americana es que es absolutamente impredictable. So I no quiero ser um, uh, held to uh, thinking that I have a crystal ball in this situation. Um, and for example, nobody expected the video of George, George Floyd's murder would set off the biggest social protest movement in American history with tens of millions of people in the streets all across the country. So there are many contingencies in a very volatile, unstable political period. But looking at the election as we see it right now, Biden is clearly ahead in the national polls, um, depending on the poll, anywhere from six to 10 percentage points ahead in the national opinion polls. Um, in the state polls, and that's the most important thing for people to understand, in the United States, we don't have a democracy. Um, the person who gets the most votes doesn't win necessarily the election. It's who wins the most votes in the electoral college, which is a portion between the different states of the country. So we have an undemocratic Um, uh, election system in the United States. So you have to look at the state polls. In the state polls, Biden is still ahead and has a path to victory that is easily seen and is doing bets way better than Clinton did in 2016 in pre-election polls and is doing as well as not better than Obama did in the 2012 election against Romney. So he has a clear path to victory um, in, in, the, in the election. Uh, if, I, if I were to predict, I would think that Biden is the most likely victor. I think the Trump administration knows this. They know that they have a weak hand in the country right now. They're behind in the polls, both nationally and in the states, including in traditional Republican dominated states. So they are in a very weak position. And I think the entire Republican party knows it. I think that in part explains the rush to get this new justice that they're nominating through into the Supreme Court because they see it as a way of locking in a set of political positions that are a minority Um, supported set of political positions in, in the country right now. So Trump is in a weak position electorally, but he's also in a weak position in terms of the structures of the US state and economy. The bulk of capital never supported Trump. They, they use the Trump administration to get what they do want, which is tax cuts and deregulation, but they do not like his protectionism his alienation of uh, US strategic allies in Europe and in many other places around the world. They don't like the America first, go it alone foreign policy strategy that um, Trump has advocated. So the, I'd say the bulk of capital, including Wall Street is tending to support Biden right now. Even centrist Republicans who are out of office are rallying to Biden As, as well. And then if you look at the heart of the American state, the US military in its brass, in its officer corps, opposes Trump and supports Biden. The State Department opposes Trump and support, supports Biden. The FBI, the CIA support Biden and oppose Trump. That is the core of the American state is behind, the US state is behind um, Biden and would prefer to see um, Biden come to power and restore neoliberalism as usual and restore US uh, imperial domination in the world, which has been so compromised by both Trump and the pandemic and the recession. And so that's, that's where most of the establishment is headed right now. Given that, I think the idea that Trump is organizing a coup is just a mis misreading of the situation. What Trump is doing is saying, is building in an alibi that if he loses the election, he will claim that it's been robbed from him that in a fair game, he would ha have, ha have won. So he's building in an alibi and he's also using that 
to fuel his hard right base to turn out and vote for him in, in the election. So he's using this um, rhetoric of not respecting the results of the election as a tool for electoral um, politics. And the other thing that he's doing is revving up the Republican Party establishment to challenge uh, uh, um, voter registration, to challenge mail-in ballots, and to engage in voter suppression. But this is what the Republican Party has been doing for decades, in fact. This is not new. What's new is the open advocacy and um, tweeting of it by Trump. That's a new phenomenon, but this is the way the Republican Party has been electorally viable for decades. It's a minority party that's based on racism and uh, uh, votes in, uh, in rural areas of the country and in um, gerrymandered districts, that is rigged districts that give the chance of Republicans to win. In any kind of fair democratic election, the Republican Party would lose, and they all know that. And they've been scheming um, to retain their position of power by fighting democracy for, for a long time. So this is standard Republican Party behavior. That said, I don't want to minimize how Trump is dramatically escalating the rhetoric and fueling the far right around this question. There is no doubt that there will be um, vigilantes that turn up at the electoral polls from the right. There is no doubt that we're going to see more far right demonstrations around uh, the election. And in the case of uh, Trump defeat, we are going to see, like I said earlier, a Tea Party style formation with likely Trump at its head with militarized factions within it. So I think that's a very dangerous um, situation that we're in. So I think there are three scenarios that are very likely in the election. The first scenario, which I think is likely, is a Biden victory in the national polls and a Biden victory in the electoral college. The second possible scenario is Biden wins the national vote and loses narrowly in the electoral college based on voter suppression and challenging of the mail-in ballots. And the third scenario, um, which I think is a possibility, is that we're going to see a rerun of the uh, George Bush versus Al Gore 2000 election, in which the entire election turned on the results of the Florida vote and was contested legally and unresolved for a month until the Democrats threw in the towel and allowed George Bush, who didn't win the election, to take the presidential office. So that's a possible situation, not only in one state, but several states through legal challenges to mail-in votes. So I think those are the three possible scenarios. In this situation, I think the tasks of the left are very clear. We have to be agitating for um, demonstrations in defense of democratic rights in our country. Number one, we should be protesting around the nomination of Amy Coney Barrett, who is one of the most extreme right-wing um, judges in the country. And her um, uh, confirmation to the Supreme Court would be a threat to healthcare, labor rights, to women's rights, to abortion, to anti-racist rights, to any number of things that are very important for our side, workers and oppressed people. And so we should be rallying people to protest that and organizing um, meetings as best we can to prepare for uh, protection of the right to vote in November and protests in the event of a theft of the election by uh, Trump through the mechanisms that I've described, voter suppression, challenging mail-in ballots, getting the election uh, won through a rigged Supreme Court with Barrett um, in, in, in confirmed to the Supreme Court. I think we need to be agitating around that. And in the event that Biden does win, it sets in motion a project of collaboration between all the different elements of the left that have been divided by the question of the election 
in protesting for the demands that we all are in favor of, that we all support. So I think it's an important thing that we do to forge as much possible unity in the midst of a highly polarized debate on the left about the election for the defense of basic democratic rights in, in the country. And many of us are trying to do that, although it's a very challenging situation to organize that because the pull of subordinating everything to campaigning and advocating for people to vote for Biden will make it challenging to organize the kind of street protests that I think are essential right now. Para cerrar, corriéndonos un poco de tema, aunque está relacionado, vos sos integrante del colectivo Tempe, recientemente formado, que propone crear un espacio para las ideas y debate del socialismo revolucionario. ¿Podrías contarnos de qué se trata este proyecto? Yeah, well, I think. You know, if you look at the US left, in many ways, it's the best of times and the worst of times. It's a kind of Dickensian moment when you think about it, because on the one hand, we have the growth of a socialist organization on a big scale, not a mass scale. We have now 70,000 members of the Democratic Socialists of America, which I'm a member of. And I think that's a tremendous development in left-wing politics in the United States. For a whole generation, Bernie Sanders has become an iconic figure and a representation of um, demands for social reform and an idea of an alternative to the capitalist horrors that we live under in the United States and uh, an idea that socialism is a real solution to this catastrophe in our society. So we have a growth of socialist politics and socialist consciousness in a way that is of tremendous significance. And I think that DSA, but not only DSA, many other socialist organizations have grown in this context. Other socialist organizations have grown into crisis amidst this um, situation. And I think we have a whole dynamic of renewal, recomposition, and uh, reinvigoration of socialism and deep thinking about how we go forward um, in the situation that we're in. So I, I'm part of the Tempest Collective and we came together out of um, people who are in various organizations, the ISO, which um, voted to dissolve to, from solidarity, um, from independent leftists, from new radicals, that are um, members of DSA or members of the labor movement and members of the broader socialist radicalization um, that are trying to come to grips with a strategic debate inside DSA and on the left in general, which has been mainly oriented for the last five years on the electoral strategy for socialism. That is, especially Bernie Sanders and a whole idea that if we could win more elected socialist leaders, we could begin to change the balance of politics in the country and change the, help change the balance of class power. So I think there's a kind of, um, not exclusively, but predominantly electoralist conception of how we're going to win socialism. That is, through using the Democratic Party ballot line, gradually building up a phalanx of um, socialist elected figures and eventually uh, launching a predominantly electoralist uh, social democratic type party in, in the country. I think that we've seen through Sanders the dead end of that project, that that strategic organization, uh, a strategy of trying to use the Democratic Party to advance the struggle of independent socialism um, because the Democratic Party will just block when it becomes significant the the socialist challenge within its ranks it will preserve its status as a capitalist parties its funders its bureaucracy and its elected uh, capitalist politicians will block us at every decisive turn that said there are a lot of elected socialists in the country that have uh only a um minor sense of accountability to the dsa um and to the social movements and labor movement. So I think what Tempest is trying to do is create a space for revolutionary socialists broadly construed, not from any particular tradition, to come together around a politics of socialism from below that accents struggle from below, workers, social movements, demands of the oppressed, that we're gonna win those largely through strikes, streets, protests, and that what we need to agitate for is for an independent electoral 
project connected to that. So shifting people away from trying to win over the Democratic Party to socialist, to socialism or social democratic politics, or to try and advance the, that project of socialism through using the Democratic Party ballot line. So it's really an argument that we have to build the struggle, build the uh, of workers and the oppressed, and build a independent electoral project connected to it. And eventually, as and frankly, as soon as we possibly can, begin launching um, discussions for how we're going to form a new socialist party in the United States that would have multi multiple tendencies in it. And I think most importantly, given the experience of broad parties throughout the world, a conscious, coherent, revolutionary pole of attraction within it. Um, so I think it's a very exciting moment. It's a very urgent moment. And I think there are many, many debates on the left about this. And I think one of the most important things is to not lock people into their current positions, but accept that it's going to be a fluid process of the recomposition of the socialist left in the coming years, where it's an urgent project that we provide a coherent political and activist alternative to the right. And that's going to be the framing battle for the next epoch. The left, how effectively it can get itself organized on clear socialist politics against the right, that is going to be increasingly radicalized, increasingly far right with fascist components to it. So welcome to polarization in the USA. Muchas gracias, Ashley. La verdad que ha sido muy, pero muy interesante escuchar tus opiniones. Vamos a estar charlando nuevamente en poco tiempo para seguir conversando y viendo qué es lo que finalmente va sucediendo en tu país.